about the most mycophobic nation in Western Europe. If you were to go anywhere else virtually, you would find that people had a lot more interest in fungi, knew more about them, um, cared more about them. Whereas for some reason, um, we've always, when I was a child, you know, the thing I was always ordered to do if you saw a toadstool, you kicked it over, didn't you? Because it was dangerous and that was the thing to do. Um, but uh, as we've seen more and more of our continental uh, neighbours visiting uh, over the last few years, it's been quite fascinating um, uh, to meet, virtually all of them seem to know more about that. There's a, there's a, um, a Bulgarian that lives not far from me, she's amazing, she knows an awful lot, she eats lots of different fungi, knows an awful, awful lot about them, and just can't believe that her neighbours show no interest in them whatsoever. But is it because, you know, this is one of the latest, the old Raymond Briggs, as I remember reading this to my kids, from Mr. Bogeyman. <laughs> you know, just, as soon as we want to think about a bogeyman, why do, why do we connect it with fungus? And we've got all these other problems with things like the fly agaric, which has some very strange connotations. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's folklore, it's history. Um, even the debate about how it even got its name. Um, it's supposedly, if you crumble up the dried cap into sweetened milk, then it will stupefy and kill flies. Um, um, a student in Aberystwyth did a little bit of a study on this recently and found really no effect on things like blue bottles or house flies, but it had a rather strange effect on, uh, on, on fruit flies, Drosophila. And it sort of, um, after it, nothing happened during the course of the day, but towards evening they suddenly took an interest um, in this um, milk which had had a, a fly garrick. And, and they drank it and then they wandered off and then remained completely stationary. <laughs> they stopped moving. <laughs> so it obviously had some effects on their nervous system. So there may be a little truth in the story. It's not just, it's not just uh, uh, old wives' tales. Um, yes, I mean, the, it, it does contain a, a hallucinogenic principle, but it also contains a number of substances that can make you rather sick. If, if the caps are dried and then consumed, they, they have a rather similar effect to alcohol, but they also affect your ability to judge shapes. So there was a, a, one of our first professional mycologists, Mordecai Cook, in the 1850s, wrote an article for the Gardener's Chronicle. And the Gardener's Chronicle was taken by most households in those days. It was the equivalent of the Daily Mail. And it described his visits to the shaman up in central Russia where fly agarics were, 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 were highly prized, they were dry, they were, they were subject to quite expensive you know, exchanges, um, and, uh, and kept them going really in the winter. It was one of their major uh, ways of overcoming SAD, this winter you know, like def you know, deficiency defective disorder. Um, and one of the stories he tells was how they used to have these sort of wild parties. The shaman used to come in bearing these dried fly agarics and would administer them to the people. And, uh, and the shaman, following various odd rituals, would then disappear, climbing up the central pole of the yurt, out through the smoke hole, and disappear um, as part of this process. Really the opposite of Father Christmas of Santa Claus. <laughs> and the colours of Santa Claus are perhaps not dissimilar to the, uh, to the red and the white of the fly agaric. So, and also, it was one of the main uh, effective, uh, effective constituents of witches' flying ointment. Um, so it creates the illusion that you are flying, apparently. Um, it's interesting, um, biologically, that warlocks were never, never thought to fly. But witches did fly, and of course, if you smear, um, um, smear these, uh, this flying ointment onto your broomstick handle, the warlocks don't have mucous membranes in the right place to absorb the, uh, <laughs> the substances, but the witches do. So that was probably why witches fly, but warlocks never flew. And also reindeer are known to consume these things and get all sort of very high and, and, and do all sorts of strange things. And uh, Mordecai re re reports on the following morning, coming, coming staggering out from the yurt the following morning and watching um, some of the, uh, the, the natives staggering home. He said they'd come across a straw in the road and they'd quizzically examine it, you know, take several steps back and then leap it over it as if it was the size of a barrel. <laughs> so, so it has this wonderful ability to alter one's perception of shapes as well. So maybe this is all part and parcel of our, you know, of our, of our 
puzzlement and our, our suspicion Alice about in all things. Hmm? Sorry? Alice in Wonderland with the mushroom. Oh, yeah, okay. There you are. Yes. You see, there you are. Yeah. Um, yes, it's fascinating because it was, about, it was about the same time that the Reverend Dodgson, um, uh, Lewis Carroll, otherwise Lewis Carroll, was, wrote his Alice in Wonderland story. And it, I think it's not without, uh, it's not just a coincidence that he chose the, the idea of this, of this piece of fungus. He's, Alice had two pieces of fungi, didn't she? She ate one, she got large, and if she ate one, she got smaller. He's a shape-shifting fungi. Um, the original drawings that went with the book apparently were in black and white, so we don't really know whether he'd intended uh, for it to be a fly agaric, but in this illustration, one of the later ones, um, it's, it's shown not really as a fly agaric. But anyway, there we have it with the, uh, yes, with the, with the tobacco uh, keeping, the, keeping the caterpillar happy, another product of the living world, <laughs> and, the, and Alice there on her, on her uh, shape-shifting uh, <laughs> shape experiences. So, you know, we've always treated these things with a huge degree of circumspection. And yet, here's me pulling out of my, my larder cupboard just a few items, um, which I think we have to remember to say thank you to fungi for. So obviously all the booze on the back there, um, well represented. Um, as with, and all the alcohol in there, of course, is coming from the yeasts, which are fungi. So the yeasts are very important and have been for thousands of years. I mean, some of the recent that they've discovered that 4,000, at least four to 5,000 years ago, we were apparently making use of yeasts in converting either milk into yogurt type products or into alcohol or whatever. So we have a long history of our consumption of the products of yeasts. And then things like the orange juice. You'd never think that you have to say thank you to a fungus for the orange juice, but when I was a lad, um, fruit juices were virtually non-existent, were very expensive. You get a brick big orange and a little glass, that's a huge expense because fruit juices are now relatively cheap. Why are they relatively cheap? Well, they're relatively cheap because uh, a, a little fungus had been found which produces enzymes very cheaply that help to digest the fruit. So you can get four, five, six times as much juice out of your fruit as you were if you just pressed it. So they're, so they're munched, crunched up and then treated with this enzyme which is, breaks down the cell walls to release even more in the way of fruit juice. So you end up with much more easy, readily available and cheap fruit juices. Obviously the bread is uh, again dependent on yeast so as an easy one, as is the marmite is of course a product of, of a yeast extract mixed with a few other interesting things like some, of the, some vegetable extracts and so on. Um, and what about the tomato ketchup? Well, interestingly, virtually all the vinegar that goes into our foods today comes from not the, not the traditional brewing process, which involved uh, things like cider going off as a result of uh, bacterial fungi, but it's, it's actually, they're all brewed in vats now using a particular sort of fungus that creates the acetic acid. Um, so virtually all the, all the, anything that's got, uh, that's got vinegar in it, you have to say thank you to a fungus for. And then of course for the, for the cheese and the butter, some of the cheeses we well know are dependent on, for their flavours on, on, on a whole range of exotic, uh, exotic um, fungi. Rochefort for example, this can only be produced in one set of caves where the walls are lined with a particular type of fungus that then colonises the cheese to give it its unique flavour and of course all the blue stiltons and things, they're inoculated with a fungus to give it that distinctive flavour. And things like the butter and milk, but, um, I mean, we're, we only realised very recently um, that, uh, that the production of milk in cows, in fact, in fact, the digestion in most of these ruminants, we thought was caused mostly by bacteria and some protozoa, because it was thought for many, many years that fungi, by and large, didn't like to live in atmospheres that were low in oxygen. It was always assumed that they needed lots of oxygen. Um, and so a, we're very lucky in that respect that we very rarely get attacked by fungi. If you think of all the fungal diseases we suffer from, it's things like um, ringworm, which is not a worm, but it's a fungus, and that's attached to the skin. Thrush, you know, the yeast or missing in your throat. Farmer's lung, which is a fungus that lives in your lungs. You know, these are, and, and things like athlete's foot. Yeah, and horrible you know, things attacking your toenails. They're all high oxygen levels. And anywhere else deeper in the body, fungi find it really rather difficult to survive. So we're not, we're not serious, but if you were an insect, 
my god, do you have some problems with fungi? Most insects meet their fate being attacked by fungi because insects, their respiratory system consists of little tubes that ramify all the way through the body. So virtually everywhere in an insect is fairly well oxygenated and the fungi are able to colonise them and we'll come back to insects. But you've got to say thank you to an awful lot of them and you hope you'll remember next time you see a dung beetle to say thank you to it. We'll, we'll work out why in a little while. And so there have been these sort of supermarket challenges for kids to, you know, to go around supermarkets and try and work out, well, what, you know, which foods you know, are we dependent on? And of course, mushrooms, you know, a billion, billion pound industry, porcini, have been dealt with the wines, the dried the yeasts, soy sauces and things like that, that's all dependent on fungi breaking down the soybeans. Um, and things like chocolate and coffee, for example, they're very dependent on fungi breaking down the outer husks of and developing the flavours that we so sort of associate with chocolate and with, with coffee. So, for example, I, uh, I, use, I love Old Government Java. And Old Government Java is a... Is a um, the, the beans are buried in a pit where the fungi rot them all down. That concentrates the flavour and then they're cleaned up. And, you know, so, so, um, so we have to say thank you then, obviously. So that's, it's fascinating what a large proportion of the food that we actually consume, um, not just things like corn, you know, this is one of our few mycoproteins. Corn is made by uh, a fusarium fungus. Um, it's again a, a, a billion pound industry. Um, and the fungus is grown in these enormous great reactor um, vessels, uh, look like giant rocket ships. Um, um, glucose liquid is put in at the top and they continuously harvest the mycelium that grows on the glucose. And the Chinese and the, and the Japanese for years have developed a huge industry growing all sorts of interesting fungi. Practically everything that we would consider as a waste product, they're able to turn into some sort of a, of a, of a rather expensive fungus. Um, things like the husks from rice uh, all get end, ending up um, being used to provide extra nutrients with, mixed in with, with things like rice straw in order to produce shiitake mushrooms and a whole range of other things. I'm not going to really go into a lot more the culture of mushrooms, but that in itself would take us all afternoon. So there we are, we have to say thank you to fungi. And they're also, one of the big problems attached to them is that they're so blooming diverse. I mean, I really struggle. Um, my next project is to produce um, a handbook to plant pathogenic fungi. It, I mean, it may seem odd that so many of our, you know, our food is dependent on managing to resist plant pathogens. And yet, uh, to my horror, I've find, over the last five or six years, I've got really interested in some of these, these, um, these fungi. And uh, discovered that there's a chap in Aberystwyth, Arthur Chater and myself. Arthur's 88. I'm, I'm no spring chicken. Um, and we've discovered that we've got nobody to turn to anywhere else. You think, you think somebody must be doing some work on plant pathogens somewhere, some university. We've hardly got a mycologist left anywhere. I mean, for example, if you poisoned yourself now with a mushroom, um, the, the, the National Health Service would have to fly um, a sample of your stomach contents to Indonesia to get it dna and then the DNA, and we send the results, email the results back tell us to, to see what sort of antidotes we might use. But we've got nobody left even at Kew Gardens now. We've got one part-time mycologist who hasn't been allowed into the department for two years, says he probably will never go back into the department before he retires. So I'm entirely dependent. We've got nobody left in Edinburgh, no mycologist there. They made the one mycologist in Cardiff redundant about five years ago. Um, so there's nobody to turn to to help with the identification of these things. So dear old Arthur and myself, and come from two others, we decided we're going to turn out, uh, every year we've turned out a new book on one particular group of plant pathogens. And the only people I turn to now for any help, if I want to know the distribution of some of these very, you know, very important crop diseases, I have to t go to the farmer's co-op and talk to the man that sells the fungicides. Because he's the only person, or she's the only person now that has any knowledge. I mean, we've got, we've got one disease now that's, that's a real worry. It's, it's uh, threatening barley. It probably caused about 15 million pounds of, of, of yield losses in barley last year alone in Britain. And I've just heard that it's now attacking in Italy. It's now attacking wheat. So we struggled and eventually we managed to find, we couldn't find a single record of it from Britain, despite the fact there was data to show that 
we were losing 15 million pounds if you got me no data not even listed in the checklist of fungi that Q used to maintain. The British Mycological Society has an extensive databases. Nobody's was available. Nobody, nobody's updated the list of fungi now for several years. Wasn't even on the list of fungi in this country. So this is we've reached that sort of desperate stage. So fortunately, they're very helpful. Most of these these fungicide salesmen, though they won't tell me which farms are affected, but they tell me which of the old counties they occur in. So we've been able to plot the distribution. It's all of South Wales now that this particular fungus is affecting. And I've managed to find it in Pembrokeshire, Arthur Shates has found it in Cardiganshire, and we know it's in Breconshire and Glamorganshire and Monmouthshire. Um, but that's the state we've reached. Um, I mean, ADAS, you know, the Agricultural Advisory Service, that was privatised by Mrs Thatcher's government. The first thing that the, that the, um, the um, agricultural company that bought it did was to get rid of all the plant pathologists. It didn't consider them to be profitable, so they got rid of anybody doing because they, because they were competing, you see, with the with the fungicide salesman. <laughs> and they realised that nobody would pay money if you could, you know, if the fungicide salesman would do it for free. And the next thing that I discovered to my horror when, when I tried to get hold of more of this data, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Math, used to maintain a very comprehensive database of all these plant pathogens. And I discovered that it was all thrown into a skip five years ago and only the data for Warwickshire, Herefordshire and Worcestershire was actually saved. So that's all gone. There's nothing left. That's, that's millions of pounds worth of, of money that we put into it just thrown away. And now, I mean, both between Arthur Chater and I, we've probably got the best collection. And I've got another good friend who specialises in rust retiree down in, in, uh, in Kidwelly. And uh, we've got thousands of packets of specimens. We've probably got the best collection ever amassed of plant pathogens. And nowhere, nobody probably wants it in this country. So at least the, the, the rusts are going to go to East Germany. And we think all the other specimens will go to North America. So I'm now having to deal with, now having to deal with both Central Europe and North America if, I, if we want to do any sort of proper work with these fungi. We have to wait often years for them. We just had a result back now, which is, which is quite gratifying. As dear old Nigel Stringer has spent the last two years, every hour of the day, measuring spores of fungi. His wife's very ill, and so in the lockdown, he didn't want to go anywhere. So he spent two years, <laughs> and he tabulated all the, all the results of, from all the books he could lay his hands on. And uh, it wasn't surprising to discover that most of them had been copied one from another, and the originals mostly were wrong. <laughs> so, so, and then, I had another, then we had another request from Q recently. Q was supposed to have the best collection of powdery mildew fungi in the world. So it had agreed as part of a world project to, to try and, and produce, you know, try and database the DNA for all these pathogenic fungi. So it agreed to do a contract and it made a start on its specimens and before very long it got into a hell of a mess because none of the results were making much sense. So they brought in a, um, um, a, a, fly, a, a flowering plant taxonomist to check the specimens and found that about 30% of the specimens um, had the host misidentified so the fungus had been misidentified on the host and that was a complete mess and this is one of my big this is one of our big problems that we we turn out these books encouraging mycologists to take an interest in the fungi uh, that live on these plants but the trouble is virtually none of these mycologists can identify the plants nobody can identify plants anymore so it's yielded virtually no records. <laughs> and the people that are interested in plants, I've been struggling, so I've decided the only way forward is I've got to get these people who are good on their plants interested in the fungi. We've managed, to, we've managed now to, uh, um, to distract two or three people in Britain, and they're doing really good work. There's one chap in Cambridge now, about every week now, turns up a new species to Britain, looking around the gardens. And it's, because things are moving so quickly, we are shifting plants and the plant material around the world so swiftly that it's almost impossible to keep up with what's going on. I mean, what, what, last week, last week um, I was told of a new fungus that's attacking cosmos. You know, it turns all the leaves white and eventually they'll shrivel up. And that appeared uh, for the first time. Uh, well, it, it, it turned out that when we finally got to the bottom of it, it had actually been around um, for about 15 years. Um, the, the horticulturists were aware of it, but the mycologists weren't. 
because they never talk. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the one and only mycologist that we've, uh, that, we've, that we've really had any contact with in the Royal Horticultural Society, God bless her, she's really good. She retired early uh, last month. And so that's the last contact with horticulturalists. And if you try and look at, uh, at the university, you say there is, there is nobody out there now. It's all gone. There's no botany departments left anywhere. There's no mycology departments. I mean, Cardiff now has, has amalgamated biology with medicine. So it's now biomedicine. I used to have an honorary lectureship in Cardiff. But they don't need me anymore because they don't do any ecology. The first two years, I only get taught the same stuff as the medics do. So you can have a hall full of 400 students. <laughs> You know, so there's no bottom at all, nobody goes out. So there we have it, it's an interesting problem. But then when you look at this, in this country, we've got about 1,300 flowering plants, about 1,000 mosses and liverworts, about 2,000 non-marine algae, and at least 40, maybe 18,000 species of fungi and lichen, because lichens are just a, an odd growth form of a fun, of different fungi. There's one site that's been well studied, and it's at the end of the district line that passes through Kew. So over the last 30, 40 years, when we did have mycologists at Kew, they regularly used to visit Isha Common. And on that common, which is 380 hectares in extent, they have now found 3,400 species of fungi. Um, and all the evidence now suggests that for every one flowering plant, you can at least have six fungi. They did a study of, um, of a bay tree in front of the mycology, the old mycology building in Kew, because nobody had ever really looked at bay. And they found 176, it looks impossible that anything eats it, you know, the bay leaves are so tough as old boots, aren't they? All the leaves are dead. But they found 173 species living on the bay, and 14 were new to science. <laughs> so, so everywhere you go, I mean, we, we probably have not described more than 5% of the total diversity of fungi in the world. So what are they? Well, well, they're organisms that are very difficult to define. They're in a kingdom on their own, really. Um, they, they, they mostly exist in this sort of strand-like form. This is, this is a wooden block in the middle, which has been inoculated with a, with a fungus that breaks down wood. And that fungus has then grown out over this jelly-like um, uh, layer that's sort of surrounding the block, looking for more blocks of wood. So this is what we call the mycelium. As you can see, it, it branches and branches and branches. And it's difficult to believe what sort of quantities of mycelium there are virtually everywhere. But if you were to go into any of these nice old unimproved fields in the Ellen Valley, look at your footprint. And if you were to dissect out all the fungus mycelium, that lies under your footprint and stretch them all out, they would stretch all the way to London and about halfway back. <laughs> there are thousands, millions and millions of miles of these things. So they interconnect everything. So yeah. the time scale is well, well, that would only have, if it was kept warm, moist, that, that would only have taken probably the best part of three or four weeks to work to that extent. I mean, they're, they're fast growing. Um, and instead of being made of cellulose, like the block, the, 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 the mycelial strands are actually made out of chitin, the substance that forms the exoskeleton of insects. So quite different. And, um, and as a result, you can manufacture tubes that are much, much finer out of chitin than you can out of cellulose. So as a plant, for example, if I was to produce a root hair, uh, and alongside it, I measured the surface area of one of these little strands of mycelium, the surface to volume ratio of, of the fungus strand would be a hundred times greater than the surface to volume ratio of the root pair. So it's not surprising that very early on in evolutionary history, um, plants rather you know, formed an, a relationship with, uh, with these fungal strands um, in order to survive. Yeah, we'll, 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 this, this is going to take, this, these are slime moles. Slime moles are animals, they're not, they're not fungi, they're not plants. So, and they don't produce the, they look like mycelium, but these are just like amoebae. Um, so they're slime moles, and here's the, this is one that's been common this year, people keep, keep sending me pictures. It looks like somebody spilled a porridge bowl, or sometimes called a dog sick. It's, not, it's a slime mole, mucinago, it's called. The one thing that all these fungi have in common is, is the structure of these mitochondria. The mitochondrion, singular, 
is a funny little structure that's inside all the cells of all of us higher organisms. Uh, they're not in bacteria, and the reason why they're not in bacteria is that we think they were once upon a time free living bacteria. So somehow this bacterium got inside one of our very early um, cells, and instead of being eaten by the cell, it, it stayed there, and over time, the cell managed to turn it into a sort of powerhouse. So all these invaginations, you see, they're called Crisky. Um, on those, there are enzymes, and those enzymes are responsible for producing a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, which is the, 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 the molecule that drives all the chemical reactions in cells. And the one thing that's interesting about the fungus mitochondrion is that those invaginations, the Christi, are all flattened, whereas all the Christi in us and in all the other plants um, are finger-like. So it looks like the fungi branched off early on in the evolution of the tree and may have acquired a slightly different bacterium. This may have happened twice. Um, but anyway. So there we have it. And so yeah, we can group fungi into, uh, into different groups. One of the main groups are these uh, sac fungi. This is perhaps the most species diverse group. Um, they sort of outnumber the, the toadstools two to one. So these, this is the orange, this is the elf cup, the scarlet elf cup, which you see in the woods around here on wet wood in the spring. It shoots its spores out. If it's a calm day and you creep up on this and you blow into it and then stand back, you will, you will see a type of spore suddenly emerge with a hiss as, well, as you disturb the turga. So if I look, look at this vertical section here, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Y-shaped thing in the middle is... Um, is uh, it's going to work. Mm, no. okay. So... Uh, Right, this, this Y-shaped structure here, this is the section through that cup, and the top here is a layer that, if you blow it up, looks like this. They're all little sausages uh, between little, little sticking up things called paraphyses, sterile um, um, processes. And the ascus shoots out usually eight of these ascus spores into the air, so you just need to disturb the turga pressure by blowing into it, and suddenly all these things shoot out, and it gets the, the fungus spores out into the upper air above what's called this sort of boundary layer. We'll come back to the boundary layer in a minute. So that's the early Ascomyces, perhaps the most diverse of all the fungi, but, pe but people barely ever notice their existence. Um, um, we eat some of them in the form of morels. Uh, and morels are now being cultured by both the Chinese uh, and in America, morels are a huge business. In fact, it's said that a lot of the forest fires in the States are actually deliberately you know, set by fungus hunters because a couple of years after the forest fires, these areas become covered in morels. But this is a false morel. The only place I've ever seen morels in mid Wales is on the wood chips that they're piled up on the bank behind Aldi. <laughs> That's it. Normally you find them in sand dunes and things. Um, but that one's poisonous. Um, Another group of these Ascomycete fungi I saw this, this morning up, in, up the Ellen Valley. Look out for this in short, mossy turf. These little orange structures stick up. And you see they've got little pimples all over them. Those pimples are flask-like structures which have those assay inside them. And they shoot off these long, thin spores. And those long, thin spores land on a caterpillar. And the spores germinate and grow inside the caterpillar. Um, not a very pleasant life, and there, 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 but there were quite a lot of these, more of them than you think. And here's one that I found uh, uh, up the Allen Valley a few years ago. This is a cordyceps, slightly different uh, uh, genus, and that's in one of these big cutworm caterpillars, probably of something like a yellow underwing. Um, yeah, we, you, if ever you need an organ transplant, you've got a lot to thank for these fungi. Um, way, way back in the late 60s, early 70s, um, researchers in Scandinavia were looking for potential drugs to ease the pain of rheumatoid arthritis. One of the problems with rheumatoid arthritis is that they, you know, the, the, the joints become inflamed. So they were looking for substances that would damp down inflammation to reduce the pain. And they were, they were experimenting with a whole series of substances that they obtained from a, a wide range of, of fungi living in soil. So you grab a few soil samples, 
and you swish them around in sterile water and then spread these over agar plates and see what grows. And you can nick out bits and grow them on and clean them up, get rid of all the bacteria, and then check to see what sort of substances they produce. Because these fungi produce an amazing range of quite a very complex chemicals. And for a chemist to manufacture some of these complicated chemicals is very expensive and incredibly difficult. Where would you start? You wouldn't know where to start. So they were sort of screening some of these things. And they found one or two that had some sort of potential, but, it, but there weren't in enough quantity. And the chap who was in charge of this project was about to throw all his cultures away. Um, but uh, before he did, he, he attended a conference somewhere else, which was on the whole business of inflammation and um, immune autoimmune problems. And he, he bumped into a, to a, to a person who was researching the possibilities of organ transplants. And they'd been looking for any chemicals that could damp down our immune response so that we don't reject the things. Um, and, uh, and so he said, well, you, you know, we'll take these cultures because the, the, it doesn't look like we're going to do anything with them. So he did. And it was, it was amazing to find that it was the first substance that they discovered we seemed to have any sort of useful effect at damping down our immune systems. And so from there on, they, they, they tried to improve the quantities. And eventually, after sampling thousands of soil samples from northern Sweden, they came up with another fungus that produced enough of this substance called cyclosporin to permit organ transplants to take place. But it was in one of these strange fungi that we had no fruit bodies from, so we didn't know where to put it. So it was, it was dumped into a group called the fungi imperfecti, which just reproduces vegetatively or produces the spores, not through sexual reproduction. And with all this work now, working on the DNA of these fungi, more and more fungi are having their DNA examined, and the, and the results of of, these, of, of, of the sequencing of, of short lengths of the fungi. We, we've sort of agreed worldwide that, that until very, very recently, it was too expensive to sequence the entire genome of an organism. I mean, it took months to do, it took years to do ours. You know? And there's still only about, well, there's still probably not more than about 3,000 species in the whole world that have had their full sequence. And most of those, interesting, now come back to this fungi. Um, there's good reasons for that. Anyway, uh, when the, but, but what, we, what we do to identify these things is we sequence just a tiny little bit um, of the genome of a particular um, organelle called the ribosomes. The ribosomes are, were one-time bacteria, rather like the mitochondria, and they live in all cells, and they help us to produce our proteins. But most of the, most of the genetic material in there doesn't seem to do anything. It's redundant. It was useful to, for, the, for the bacterium to reproduce itself but it doesn't need it anymore because we help with the reproductive processes. So it's all redundant, but any, any mutation that takes place at any time then tends to get preserved. It isn't, it isn't removed by selection, it's just kept. And so it forms a sort of clock and it allows us to look back through time. So we can say that all these fungi, they've got this one mutation in common. All that lot have got another mutation in common. They don't share those. So they must have, they must have part of company somewhere Back, and we can work out now from the from the speed at which these mutations take place. We can actually guess or estimate the time when all these different species diverge. So this is an you know, incredibly um, incredibly important. Anyway, having having produced these odd DNA sequences, um, what surprised the uh, the pharmaceutical industry was the discovery that the soil fungus from northern uh, the DNA from the soil fungus from northern Scandinavia matched the DNA from a fungus that attacks dung beetles. It lives in the larvae of dung beetles and produces fruiting bodies like this out of a dung beetle. And it turned out that were one and the same, that the soil fungus lives in the soil, breaking down organic matter, but then it, 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 it infects dung beetles. And that formed a big, so this is why you have to say thank you to a dung beetle. And of course, as soon as, that was, as, soon as they realized this, there was an absolute scramble um, in the pharmaceutical industry to look at all, they suddenly got interested in all this soil fungi, and all this, all this insect eating fungi. And within a very short space of time, um, a, chemical had been, a chemical had been found in cicadas. These cicadas that take 15, 17 years? Yeah, they found a, we found a substance in there um, which seemed to slow down the onset of Alzheimer's. And now in the States, it's a multi billion dollar industry.
So there's a mass, because an awful lot of the problems that we're now left with dealing with are all these sorts of inflammatory autoimmune type problems. So heart disease, you know, problems of clogging arteries, Alzheimer's, the problems of autoimmune destruction, Parkinson's, you name it, rheumatoid arthritis. All this is all, all autoimmune. And so, uh, so uh, why would we? I mean, one of the other things we've recently discovered, for example, in lichens, is an enzyme that breaks down prion proteins, the cause of mad cow disease. And you think, well, why would a lichen want, you know, want something that attacks prions? But of course, lichens are incredibly, some of them incredibly long-lived. And prion proteins <coughs> are proteins that have become so complexly folded that virtually nothing can break them down, except the fungi have come up with an enzyme. Because they, over the course of time, they presumably manufactured proteins that are badly folded and start to clog them up, but they've evolved this enzyme that breaks the proteins down. And so we go on. So and there are all sorts of reasons why you have to say thank you to a fungus. Um, and you know, there's no real knowing um, I mean, how... Well, what's happened here? Um, so, yes, that's one I was looking at today this, that, that Saoirse had found. She'd found two, um, two different sorts of this particular um, club fungus up in one of her meadows. Uh, couldn't find them, but you'll have to go and find them because we're, we're really desperate to understand the, the, the diversity in this group and it looks like she's found at least two different sorts different to this one. This was taken up the Ellen Valley by where the old railway line was by the bottom dam, but she's found two different ones up on her farm. Um, and other things like the autumn colours, the green patch in there, um, that's caused because on the underside is a, is a powdery mildew. Um, and the little brown bits on there, they look like you know, caterpillar droppings. When you blow them up, yeah, they still don't look much like that. But if you look at them, look at the top, that's what they actually look like. Um, they've got these prongs that stick out. And the prongs bend backwards and ping this little fruit body off the other side of the leaf. And it then descends like a shuttlecock. And you see at the bottom, there appear to be shaving brushes. And they secrete glue. And so it sails down to the ground, glues itself to the soil underneath the tree. And then next spring a crack appears around the middle and what was the, the bottom cranks back and these, in this case the two spored assai stand up and when the new leaves have emerged on the tree it shoots off its spores too. So that's all, that's all that going on in that little bit of caterpillar dropping and the little bit of white fuzz on the underside of the leaves. And other things that fascinate me, a fungi like this, this is epichloe, um, the cause of choking grasses. Turns out to be, we don't. See, it's, it's about if you look for it, you may have noticed it. Where you know, it seems it stops the grass flowering, and you think it would be bad for the grass, but in, but in fact, it turns out that the grasses that have got um, uh, choke growing within them tend to produce far more, 80% more seeds than ones without. And the reason is that the choke fungus lives throughout the entire grass plant, and it produces toxins that stop uh, prevent the grass being eaten by caterpillars or in like cut worms and all this sort of thing and also by our grazing stock so this can be a cause of grass staggers um, in sheep for example um, this white substance white uh, uh, fuzz here eventually turns into something rather like that uh, orange caterpillar fungus but it produces lots of these little flask like perithecia and a fly comes along and lays its, it lays its eggs um, at the top of these lengths and the little fly larvae then gobbles up virtually all of these little flask-like structures. The only difference is by the time it gets to the bottom the fly then pupates but inside its gut it keeps all the last of the spores and as the fly flies off it then excretes the spores over grass all over the place. Um, and it's interested me that, that so many grasses suffer from this particular fungus as do as they do with this one. This is this is ergot. You know, some of you who suffer from migraine will be highly grateful for your ergotamine. This is one of the substances that was extracted from ergot. It constricts the peripheral or affects the, 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 the peripheral blood vessels. So it's the one of the few substances that can actually ameliorate the the, the pain of, uh, of, of migraine. Um, it was used also to staunch bleeding. Um, in childbirth, it was used to, to, as an abortive patient to procure abortions. It was used also to help expel the placenta after childbirth and, and was you know, regularly administered and saved, no doubt, thousands of lives of um, uh, women. Um, 
and now it's produced, um, ergotamine is produced artificially. Um, but it attacks um, the grass flowers. This particular horn-like structure is the fungus, and it's a structure called a sclerotium. It just consists of a dense mass of fungal hyphae, um, all welded together by a substance called melanin, which is quite an extraordinary substance. It seems to protect, it's what seems to protect the fungi, so you can put them in outer space, and they survive in outer space, in no atmosphere whatsoever. It allows them to survive. And it's allowed a whole series of, of about 15 species of fungi to evolve recently that live inside the sarcophagus of Chernobyl nuclear power station in radiation levels that kill everything else. And all these fungi are black, but they're rich in melanin. All their mycelium is covered in melanin that protects them from radiation. So lots of different grasses suffer from this. It's always been a puzzle to me as to, oh yes, I should say, you know, the, the next stage in the life cycle is that that, the, that the, those, these horn-like structures in, fall to the ground and in the spring they produce these drumsticks and there's those funny little pimples which spit out long thin spores. The long thin spores are released just at the time when the grass is in flower and those long spores wrap around the stigma and immediately the fungus infects the stigma, grows down into the ovary and initiates the production of nectar. Grasses are closely related to lilies and they appear to still have the genes for nectar which are switched off this fungus switches the genes back on again and then secretes its own little spores into the nectar so the flies are attracted in, consume the nectar and the spores go right through the fly and out the other end and get spread by the flies. So, but it was the cause of immense problems. We think that virtually all the witchcraft trials in, medi in, in medieval times were almost certainly all due to poisoning by ergot um, because it creates convulsions, you know, there's all sorts of, you can get a completely healthy in the morning by lunchtime you've, you've sort of gone rigid on the floor as a result of ingesting uh, these the, the ergots were present often in rye in particular but also in wheat and cereals and if you had a wet summer an awful lot of the cereals got infected and that ended up in the flour and we ended up consuming it in the bread and interestingly there were two different sorts of it's called ergotism there was a convulsive sort which took place mostly in the centres of continents, so this is Salem and the witchcraft trials in, 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 in North America. Um, uh, and also, uh, we, we've, we realise that virtually all the religious revivals seem to take place following wet summers. And of course, one of the chemicals in here is LSD. So, <laughs> speed. <laughs> so, is, that any, is, is this why we don't... We don't seem to go in for religious revivals on the same, at the same pace anymore. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, so um, around the coast you end up with gangrenous um, um, ergotism, which unfortunately means that when you try to shake hands with somebody, your hand comes off, your nose falls off, your ears fall off, because the uh, the ergotamine constricts all your peripheral blood vessels, um, and it seems to be because the, the people around the coast eat more oily fish, and the oily fish protect you from the convulsive one but you end up with the gangrenous ones anyway uh, I won't go into it anymore it's rather tedious but there we are but I think what fascinates me is that so many of the grasses seem to cohabit and tolerate the presence and of course if you're a grazing animal you're just like us so so a cow or a horse or a deer consuming these grasses ends up aborting losing its offspring so the grasses, the grasses, it's not been in the interest of the grasses to become resistant to these fungi, I think. And so the grasses have co-evolved. And, and so the, the, this, this, this union between the grass and the fungus is actually able to control the number of herbivores. And, and if there's fewer herbivores, the grass produces more seed, and so it does better. So all this, it's all feedback mechanisms, all interactions. And of course, when it comes to things like lichens, this is the ultimate in uh, communal living. And we now realise that um, they're not just a fungus and an alga or a photosynthetic bacterium, but recently we've discovered there's at least two different yeast fungi seem to live in all of them. And the Chinese claim there's over 60 different bacteria. So it's an actual ecosystem that we're looking at there. And uh, we could spend the whole time talking about them. This was the picture that a, that a German called Schwedener in the 1850s drew of what he saw. He claimed that you know, for the first time that those, that those green blobs were an alga 
um, and, the, and the orange bits and the white bits were the fungus. Um, in this country, virtually all our experts on lichens were uh, vicars, they were all reverends. Um, and this was just after there'd been all the kerfuffle uh, and the, eventually the, uh, the abolition of slavery. And unfortunately, Sweden had described the relationship as the algae being enslaved by the fungus, which was probably not a great idea, really, because all our um, uh, vicars in this country all went to their graves, firmly believing that these funny little round things were some sort of reproductive bodies of the lichen and weren't an algorithm. They wouldn't accept this enslavement. If you described this as a, as a positive, useful, cooperative venture, I wonder if they'd have accepted it. I think they might have done, but it's just the way it was presented. This is what's so important in this presentation all along. Anyway, there we go. And so everywhere you look now, we're going to see more and more of this particular orange lichen because it likes ammonia, it likes the base rich bark. And it's now spreading rapidly around the ship to see all the chicken farms. So I'm using species like this to monitor the impact um, of all the intensive livestock units. And so lichens are very good for that. And then you'll see now, as the sycamore leaves fall, you'll see the remains of these, these black areas. These are the sclerotia, the black things, rather like the, the horn on the ergot. These are the sclerotia of a tar spot fungus, a ritisma. Now, those leaves will fall to the ground, remain on the ground over winter. And if you examine these black things in the spring, you'll be amazed to discover that they crack open to, to reveal the most wonderful blue-green um, furrowed structures that spit off spores to reinfect the sycamore leaves. Um, leaves that are infected with the retisma seem to be more attractive and the aphids do better on them than if they don't have the tar spot fungus. So we, we're understanding now that these relationships are almost everywhere. The your runner beans get attacked by black bean aphids, um, but no other aphid, yeah? We all know about black bean. Why? Well, it turns out that the runner bean is very clever in, or, or has evolved <laughs> Clever. It's evolved um, to lack a couple of rather vital vitamins for aphids, and so most aphids um, can't survive by feeding on the juice of runner beans. But the black bean aphid can. Why does it do that? Well, it turns out the black bean aphid cultures in little pockets in its gut yeast fungi that are specially adapted to produce the two missing B vitamins. <laughs> so. And everywhere you're looking here, though, are these very weird and wonderful <laughs> relationships, all linked together, one with another. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the woodworms that are at this very moment, no doubt, eating your grandmother's dresser, if not your modern, your modern furniture, because it's plastic. <laughs> but they're only capable of surviving on the wood because they have inside them yeast-like fungi that provide them with the extra nutrients. And those yeast-like fungi are passed on from one generation to another. The little woodworm be mother beetle has these pockets around her ovipositor and she deposits the yeasts onto the surface of the uh, egg as they depart. And some of these relationships are very complicated. There are lots of, uh, of um, things like scale insects and so on that the, the female can take a decision over whether she, she actually sticks a few of these um, yeasts from there on the egg or not. The ones that she puts the yeast on turn out to be turn to be female, and the ones without the yeast are males, because the males don't need as much nutritional quality to produce sperm as a female does to produce eggs. So, the, so this relationship between the fungus is determined by the, uh, um, uh, the presence or absence of a particular fungus. Oh, so yeah, these relationships are, are truly awesome. It's how complex they are. So, I mean, there was there was. Part, Paul researcher recently had been busy working on looking at the, trying to construct all the DNA sequences for a particular group of beetles um, and he proudly you know, got done about 15 or 20 of these sequences and one day a friend came to stay who was interested who was actually sequencing fungi and he just happened to look over his shoulder as he was doing you know, putting together the table and looking at the sequences and he had a look at it and said oh that's interesting he said that's that's just like some of the sequences I get out of my fungi can't be. Yeah, like, I don't know what it's like. Well, well, let's look at the others. My God, they're, they're, they are my fungal sequences. <laughs> it turned out that, 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 that what he'd been sequencing 
where the sequences of fungi that line the inside of the guts of these beetles. If you look inside a beetle's guts, it has all these bristle-like structures that look like the villi inside our gut to increase the surface. They're actually all fungi. And they can't survive without this is why often you'll see when caterpillars shed their skin they also shed part of the lining of their guts and then the caterpillar has to eat the skin if it's going to survive because it then gets the gets the um, the, the back, it gets these these yeast back and then the bacteria and everything else it, it, and the things like i suspect I, under, I suspect if you look at things like butterfly eggs they're incredibly complicated in their sculpturing and i think that sculpturing is just to help retain all these associated organisms because for the caterpillar to survive it's got to eat its own eggshell if it doesn't eat the eggshell it doesn't survive so yeah other relationships yes a lot of fungi instead of producing mycelium have disappeared broken down into little spherical cells called yeasts and in the wild you will find yeast present in the nectar of, of most most plants um, and indeed, you know, the, if it's been a, a particularly mild period, some of these, some of this nectar will have fermented because of the yeast. So you end up with these tipsy butterflies staggering around, having consumed too much alcohol, not quite knowing where they are <laughs> because of that. So yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so fungi, the basidiomyces, the next group, um, the big group. These these are the ones that have. Some of them have gills. The gills are lined with uh, little football-like structures that spit off two or mostly four spores at a time. And those four spores have to just be, sh to be shot accurately into the gap between the two gills. Shoot them off too far and they crash into the gill opposite. You've got to drop them, you've got to hit, get them so that they line up between the two gill plates. And those gill plates have to be arranged so that they lie vertically. And they, then the fungus can adjust them. Um, and the, uh, uh, that's what the stalk does and the cap adjusts itself. So those spores get dropped down into the air. But the whole point of the, of, the, of the mushroom is to get this cap above this, this layer, this still area of, the still layer of air, the boundary layer, is to get it above that in order that the spores will be dispersed uh, further. I mean, a mushroom, for example, will be producing about 4 million spores an hour um, and uh, 1,000 million you know, for a big fruit body is not, not unreasonable. I got students once to work out um, from a giant puffball how many spores there were. And, and if all those spores grew into, a, into one giant puffball and you put them all side by side, how far would it stretch? Well, the answer is it would stretch all the way to the sun and a third of the way back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously there wouldn't be enough material in the earth to even manufacture them, but it just gives you some idea as to how many spores. I mean, I'm just absolutely gobsmacked looking at these pathogenic fungi. I just don't know how they get about, how they can possibly even find their hosts. You know, it's a, it's a really incredible... Yeah. Um, was it somebody? Somebody pointed out to me a, a goat beard on the road version and Dodd here, which had a smut fungus living on the goat beard. It converts the whole flower into sort of massive black powder. Um, well, it's I mean, when you see goat beard around here, there's hardly any goat beard, for example. It's a biennial. It's it's a very narrow leaves. It's a tiny. You know, it's got a tiny surface area, and somehow those spores have to find the next goat beard, which might be miles away. I mean. My dear wife uh, in her garden in, 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 in Landau, we, we, she, she, she showed me this wonderful plant of uh, um, a field madder. Um, and I, uh, there's, a, there's a one, of, one fungus I was quite interested in because Arthur had found this fungus on the dunes at Inislas where the madder also occurs. Hardly a known madder plant between here and Inislas. Over two years, um, madder came up. It's an annual, it came up each year, flowered beautifully. But in year three, it all went down with a mildew. And the mildew just about knocked it right back. And, uh, and the following year, a few of the seedlings came up and they all got knocked back by this mildew. Uh, but around the corner, some, some seedlings had obviously established themselves and they all grew perfectly. Um, but I'm just, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. Where the hell did this matter get its, infect, get its spore from that infected it eventually? Where did that come from? I mean, how many million spores would they have to produce to hit a madder plant when we only know of probably 12 of them, the whole of Radna shed? You know, you'd think they'd soon go extinct, wouldn't you? And why, if it's so good at spreading around, did it not manage to get 
six yards to the other bank. <laughs> <laughs> if that's so in line, none of it adds up, folks. And then, when you see, then you have to begin to, to believe in, in, the, in, a, in a benevolent Lord when you realise that he's also created these amazing earth stars. This is about the highest evolution of the fruit body of any of the, of the fungi, really. So this is a, this is a puff ball on stilts. It's, <laughs> it's, that, can you find that round? I've never yeah, seen yeah. it. Yeah, well, you've got to look underneath, underneath yew trees in oh. old churchyards. Oh, right. um, this is one called Giastrum fornicatus. <laughs> not because it, not because it's fornicate, but for, to fornicate apparently is to touch. Oh. So it starts off with with two layers surrounding this 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 spherical object at the top, down at soil level. And those two layers dry out, separate, and they and they end up like that. So these these they sit on top of to to push the thing up out of the boundary layer up into the upper air. So this is yeah this is in the churchyard at. Um, Blaisbury, yeah. There are three different sorts of these puffballs. They're getting, I don't understand it, they're getting rarer. I, don't, I, I can't seem to find them as, as I did 10, 15 years ago. Um, Clandavati is a great churchyard to look in. This is that churchyard way down deep in the bottom of a valley as you head over the Epping from Brecon, from Bilf. It's just on the left-hand side. You can park easily on the right-hand side. Have a look in that churchyard. Going through the Lich Gate, um, on the west side and then look at the yew trees to your right and you will, you will see um, if you're lucky scores of this wonderful tiny little earth star which completely perplexed me because I couldn't work out what on earth it was and it turned out it was an undescribed spe new species of science but the Dutch beat us by about five weeks to describing it <laughs> so but that church has got two of these earth stars in. and then there's the extraordinary this is, this is a, a, a phallus impudicus, um, which has punched its way through tarmac. <laughs> I can't remember, I used to remember the figures for the, for the amount of pressure that can be exerted. But I mean, the things, the things this looks as if it's made up. I mean, if I had to try and poke a hole through tarmac with a lump of polystyrene, it would it'd be, it'd be completely daffy, wouldn't it? You'd have to you'd end up with crumbs. But, but these things somehow managed to do it. So we've got this lengthening white um, tubular object which pushes up this cap at the top, it's called the gleba. And that cap consists of a mass of sticky spores that stink to high heaven. And really the flies love it. The flies all pile in, gobble it all up, but the spores pass right through the flies and get spread by the flies. Um, so that's Phallus impudicus. This was the, the fungus that Charles Darwin's sister used to quietly go out uh, um, uh, with a torch at night when all the maids had gone to bed um, and she would quietly remove them from the garden and then burn them in secret on the nursery fire apparently because she didn't want them to inflame <laughs> the, the presence to, to inflame the, the housemaids. <laughs> Apparently that's true, <laughs> but then of course the Victorians did hide the table legs, didn't they? Mm -hmm. um, and then another sort of uh, toadstool, which instead of having caps and everything, are, the, are these, uh, I think they're lovely, these spindles, they call them spindles. Uh, so this is the golden spindles, which is quite a common species in most years, and often around and under Bracken, but this year I haven't seen any. So I don't know what's going on. So this is what a basidium looks like, the one in the middle is a typical one. Uh, they could be in different shapes and sizes, but this is what millions of them line the gills of the mushroom as you spread it out on your toast for tea. Um, these, these are the basidia, they give their names to basidiomyces. And there's a classic basidiomyces, this is the honey fungus. Um, said to be one of the largest organisms in the world, with well, this one colony in the States spreads over about 10 hectares. And it's all genetically identical, it was obviously one big individual. Um, Producing white spores from the gills. Um, um, I've got specimens here, um, and uh, it has it, it's, it's able to spread quite long distances because it produces from the bottom. It produces these black bootlace-like structures called rhizomorphs, which are which are able to allow it to spread between one lump of dead wood to another lump of dead wood or from one of your Michaelmas daisies to your dahlias, if you're unlucky enough to have one of them that's killing all your herbaceous stuff. Um, these rhizomorphs, when they're actively growing, are said to glow in the dark. So if you see a stump glowing, don't be too frightened. It's probably only the honey fungus having its tea. 
<laughs> in America, they do these things so much better. There are loads of fungi that seem to fluoresce in the States. We have the same species in this country, but for some reason, they don't seem to want to fluoresce. And still, the whole process is quite mysterious. Um, I never did ask about time. I haven't got a watch. I haven't asked time. I've been um, going for we days. Are about what, past two is, now. What, what, what do you want to do? What is the program? We've, we've been learning for about an hour. Yeah. It would be good to move around and yeah. get the blood moving again yeah. in the body. <laughs> yeah. And we can I'll put out some of the specimens and you can look at those. Um, great. And have a break. And then, so then yeah, really then what, we have another session or I don't know what we're planning to do. Yeah, um, well, the plan was do some learning, have a little break, have a cup of tea and then come back and do some drawing. Yeah. Well, I think you've seen enough of the, the diversity of some of these yeah. from there. My mind has been thoroughly blown, that's sure. <laughs> <laughs> weather, yes, the weather is... Hmm? Sorry. How many key species are there? How many key classifications? How many, how many groups? Groups, yeah. Groups, okay, right. Uh, well, I mean, if, you, if, we, if we start off at the very bottom of the living world, um, we're now dividing it up into one group called the Archaea, which I think are going to be very important and we didn't even know they existed until a very few years ago. And these are species that probably evolved before there was any oxygen on the earth. And they're now deep down underground in here. And they're probably responsible for most of the mineral deposits, mining the minerals, and solubilizing them so they formed into veins so we could extract them. And they're also possibly responsible for those contentious for a lot of the gas and oil deposits. And they, they don't like oxygen, so they're all down there. And they're very primitive, and they're even more simple than most bacteria. And, they and they're called the archaea. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the bacteria, the whole group of bacteria-like organisms. These lack a nucleus, they lack cell organelles like the mitochondria. So they're again one of the early forms of life. Um, uh, and then you've got the next lot, the protozoa, which are most of these single-celled animals. Yeah, protozoa. And then, probably in terms of evolutionary, we've then got the fungi as the, sort of one of the basal things. And when the fungi are probably more closely related to the animals than they are to the plants. But we've got one problem. Um, so you've got plants, animals, but we've got one problem that there's a group of organisms that don't fit into this at all. And they're causing me immense trouble because the English language is pretty crap at inventing new terms. I mean, you try, you try inventing names for these things. It's incredibly difficult. I, mean, I, I looked here. There's a website. There's a website that that, um, that evaluates on a world scale a lot of these fungi. Um, I'm probably not going to have time to even deal with that. Um, but some of the names that the, the, some of the continentals have. There, there was there was one called the Strathy Strangler. <laughs> I love that. Unfortunately, it didn't make it as an internationally threatened species, but it was first described from Strathy in Scotland, and it strangles powder cap fungi. So the, the poor old powder cap fungus starts to produce innocently this lovely little, um, little um, neat little toadstool caps, but instead of, of it producing its own toadstool cap, this wretched fungus takes over and, and, turns, and the whole of the top of the fungus turns into the strangler. How does that work? I can't even begin to imagine. I mean, does it, is it lurking beside it, waiting for these primordia to develop, and then somehow it pops in and takes over the whole thing? So that's the Strathy Strangler. Yeah, there was another one called the Hot Drops, which I thought was lovely. <laughs> and then, and there, was, there was one that actually made it as a world threat, and it was a lichen, and it was it's called the Appalachian Dust Bunnies. <laughs> yeah. They all sound, sound like weird pop groups, don't they? But, but sitting there, but sitting, I mean, the, the Strathy Strangler was coined by a, a, a very bright a, a, a young lady who now uh, lives way out on one of the offshore islands in the west coast of Scotland. She was brilliant at inventing names. But I find it incredibly difficult to invent these names and things. But anyway, uh, so I've got this problem with this group called the, the, uh, uh, the Chromista. And, and they consist of the Phytophthoras. You all know about Phytophthoras, so they're killing things like the, old, the, the archers around here. We've got Phytophthora killing hollies in southern England. We've got a new Phytophthora as of last month killing Douglas fir down in Cornwall. So they're real, and the potato blight is the Phytophthora. So it's, a, it's a sort of water, yeah, and the water moles. These all turn out, you see, not to be susceptible to fungicides. 
And the reason is that their cell walls aren't made out of chitin, they're made out of cellulose-like materials. So they're not susceptible to most fungicides. So it took us a long while to work that one out. But now, and then of course, there was, uh, and, uh, and, and, th and they, they, they appear to be very closely related to brown seaweeds. So brown seaweeds, so fungi appear to be brown seaweeds that have lost their photosynthetic ability. And the diatoms and the xenoflagellates you know, turn out to be crummy. But it means that, that I'm ending up with, I mean, some of these book titles now are a complete nightmare because I'm dealing with fungi that, that are not fungi. So, so the titles run something like, um, you know, plant pathogenic fungi and fungus-like organisms. <laughs> it's a real catchy title, isn't it? Because <laughs> we haven't got an English name yet for these things. They're clearly not fungi, so what are we going to call them? Yeah, it just seems so pathetic that we can't come up with a. But, but it's difficult to find a name that encompasses brown seaweeds, phytophthoras, and downy mildews. <laughs> and our mildew. Well, see, should we reserve mildews for the chromista and keep molds for the fungi? <coughs> Is that possible? Can we turn the clock back in definitions? Very difficult. Anyway, sorry, but it's all part of the. I mean, all part and parcel of the. I mean, you have to think of as you as you paint your picture of the landscape. You can contemplate, you know, the way in which all these interactions are going taking place. And, and all these fungus must live off something yes. else. Yes. Yeah, they can't. Because they, they can't. Yeah. Yeah. No, they can't produce their own food. So they they didn't evolve until the start, really. Of, well, the archaea were the start, and they divide their energy by breaking down um, uh, um, uh, chemicals. Anyway. <laughs> So that's the other alternative source of energy. So, you know, we've all seen the black smokers <coughs> in the deep trenches of the ocean, these, these, these vents, volcanic vents, which have their own amazing ecosystems. <coughs> that was probably the very likely first life on Earth. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, it's not been very related to art, really, has it? <laughs> but, I mean, this particular toadstool here produces the most incredible colours if you want to dye wool. You can dye wool yeah. almost that colour. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you so much for that. <laughs> right. There's a tile waltz into Well, it's, yes, I'm sorry, yes. I, mean, I must so be bonkers to even, I mean, it's a bit like, Ray, will you come and talk to us about animals? <laughs> so, so the only difference between animals and fungi is that fungi are much more diverse, there's many more of them, and they're a lot more complicated. <laughs> So you have to be in barmy to contemplate trying, don't you really? <laughs>